By the time you are done listening to this talk, someone aged 15 to 24 will have killed themselves. The reality of mental illness, of anxiety and depression is worse than you may think. Today, I'll be talking about why people don't come out about their mental problems, why people get overwhelmed, and what we, as a society, need to do to solve the underlying stigma that surrounds mental illness. Now, a 2004 report by the World Health Organization looked at rates of psychiatric treatment. The results are unbelievable. Between 30 and 80% of people with mental health concerns never receive treatment, depending on the illness. And it's generally acknowledged that these rates are lower than what's actually going on, because in the end, some people just never speak out. And here's why. Now, there's a list of eight reasons why people don't talk out about the problems that they're facing, and which is really the crux of the problem. And this applies from everything from suicide to panic disorders. Lack of insight, limited awareness, feelings of inadequacy, distrust, hopelessness, unavailability, practical barriers, and fear and shame. Of these eight, seven of them are either directly or indirectly related to stigma. Fear and shame is the most common reason why people don't come out about their mental illness, and it's deeply intertwined with stigma. There's just so much negative stigma and just underlying discrimination surrounding mental illness, and it stops people from ever coming out. And another one of the biggest problems that we see is that some people don't even understand how these illnesses work. Some of my friends think that having a panic disorder means you wake up one day and you're like, whoa, I'm feeling anxious today. And you know, that's just not how that works. So to help everyone better understand how this works, I'd like to present a story. The story of David Fitzpatrick. David Fitzpatrick grew up in Guilford, Connecticut, and during his late teens and early 20s, he began the slow descent into mental illness. And at worst times, he would cut himself with razor blades. Cutting, for those of you who don't know, is where you take a blade and you cut yourself to release stress or deal with anxiety, generally without intent of suicide. And it's the most common form of self-injury. And self-injury in general is a really unhealthy way to cope with these problems. And David says in an interview, you want to hold on to it because it's a great way to cope. Obviously, it's not a great way to cope, but that's how I felt. I felt like this relieved stress better than anything. Later, he says, for me, it was just a growing depression and shame and self-rage and loathing. I got so overwhelmed. I feel like I can't tell anyone about this because it's so bizarre. And for a lot of people, this is exactly how it goes. David was just a teenager when this stuff started happening to him. And we were unable to, uh, unable to intervene because we as a society have stigmatized mental illness. We refuse to talk about it. We think lesser of people that are affected by it. We are never taught how to cope with it and how common it is in school. You have tons of people resorting to things like cutting and self-injury when there are much better ways to cope. Now, I too suffer from some form of mental illness. I have a panic disorder where I'll get anxiety attacks over the smallest things, from almost failing a test to almost getting detention from being late to class. And these reasons may seem laughable to most, but that's exactly what makes it so hard to talk about. Because a lot of panic disorders, a lot of anxiety attacks, they come from these small things. And for a lot of people, it's really difficult to talk about because people don't understand what it's like. Now, for me, when I get an anxiety attack, my heart rate will go above 100 for around an hour. I have trouble writing, doing anything that requires fine motor skills. I can't lift heavy things, and my entire body is just shaking. It's pretty bad, and the thing is, it's really difficult to talk about because a lot of people don't understand 
how this works. A lot of people don't understand what people like me go through. And so, me, I feel like I'm just gonna get judged or laughed at. But for me, this started back when I was in first grade. And so, in third grade, I got the help I needed when a teacher came to me and talked to me and figured out what was going on because I didn't even know what was happening to me. So, I got the help I needed. However, this rarely happens for anybody. Mental illness in my generation has gotten worse and worse. However, treatment levels have remained constant. This needs to change. So what can we, as a community, as a nation, as a world, what can we do to solve the underlying stigma that surrounds mental illness? Well, we need to start at the root. Where is this stigma coming from? Why do people know so little? The answer lies within our education system. Health classes across the nation either teach too little or too late. The public is misinformed, and the later we teach these concepts, the less likely they are to actually make a difference. People develop their stereotypes early, and we need to thus intervene early. We need to teach students about what mental illness is like. We need to teach students about how to cope with these types of things instead of resorting to things like self-injury that they learn about on the internet. We need to teach students about what they may go through. And trust me, this type of education is worth it. One in five students go through some sort of severe mental illness at this time. And everyone goes through some sort of mood swings, and everyone's indirectly affected through friends, family, and people we know. So really, the best place to start is in schools. If we can create a nationwide standard for mental health education, we can go far in curing the stigma that surrounds mental illness and help teenagers feel less marginalized and ignored. Make sure that their voices are heard. Because in the end, that's what really matters. Now, for those of you out, in, out there in the audience who are still skeptical about stigma being a major issue, consider this. 20 years ago, someone who wanted to bully you had to do it to your face. Now, they can do it anonymously, hiding behind a computer screen. 30 years ago, advanced classes and getting into a top college weren't as hard and weren't as big of a deal as they are now. The situation has changed, and we need to act off of it. Another thing we need to do is we need to essentially make schools a safer place for students to be in and share their thoughts and share what they're going through. Because for me, I was too scared to tell anyone about what was going on, and for a lot of people, a lot of their anxiety attacks come from school. For me, it's the only thing that creates anxiety. And that's really the thing. And I got lucky. A teacher came to me, but this rarely happens. And if you look at a school like the school I go to, Glencoe High School, we have thousands of students. You can't have teachers going to every student. It just doesn't work. So we need to increase trust in the school environment so that way students feel safer and they feel like they have someone that they can go and talk to about their concerns. Finally, we need to look at this from a financial viewpoint. If reforms don't get funded, then reforms don't happen. One in five of our students goes through some sort of severe mental illness. And yet, only 4% of our health budget is directed towards mental illness for all ages. We need our budget to reflect the types of problems and the types of situations that we're dealing with in our country. It's time to change our budget to reflect the problems that we're going through. So, as a society, we have ignored mental illness. We refuse to talk about it, we refuse to put together reforms, we refuse to fund it. We stigmatize it to such a point where teenagers are afraid to talk out and refuse to ask for help. We, as a society, cannot continue to fail our younger generation. It's time to lift the veil.